Banarasi Sari, synonymous with the rites of Hindu traditions, worn by women in virtually every religious and social occasion. A traditional Hindu wedding is virtually unimaginable without it. Often such a sari is gifted to the goddesses of the Hindu pantheon. It is also perhaps most symbolic of the composite culture of India. Virtually all these saris are woven by master weavers who are devout Muslims. Indian pluralism is a heritage of history that was cherished by the leaders of the Indian national movement. These leaders were convinced that India's pluralism is an integral whole whose dominant logic is not confrontation but an acceptance of coexistence. Secularism you're using it as a word, as a concept, it's obviously a modern concept, but this society has basically rested on this kind of a consensus, on mutual adjustment, on mutual accommodation. So secularism was an idea that was, as it were, imposed from the above, but again, it was done so because people were sensitive to the fact that this, this society rests, operates, on an inter-community network. Sarai Khalil, in the Chandani Chowk area of the walled city of Delhi. In this muhalla or locality, the Muslims are in majority. It is the time for the Hindu festival of brotherhood, Raksha Bandhan, when women tie a string around their brother's wrists as a symbol of love and affection and the brothers promised lifelong protection and care. Over the years, this festival has come to symbolize brotherhood in more ways than one. For here in the alleyways of Sarai Khalil, we see girls of Muslim households making the traditional rakis. My name is Sajida. I am Susan Iqbal Rakhi. I am making three months of Rakhi. I am making Rakhi. I am making Rakhi. I am making Rakhi. These rakis will then be sold by Hindu traders to Hindu women for a Hindu festival. For these girls in the alleyways of Chandani Chok, this is no novelty. But for social scientists, it is yet another tangible evidence of a composite culture and a cultural continuity. It could have been easy for those who assumed the responsibility of a truncated India in 1947 to have accorded special privileges to the majority community. Instead, they looked deep within the Indian heritage, much beyond the mere 200 years of colonial rule, to establish a free India, where every citizen, irrespective of his faith, has equal rights, has equal privileges. Redefining secularism within the Indian ethos, Article 25 of the Indian Constitution enshrined the right to profess, practice and propagate religion freely. The significance of the decision of the Constituent Assembly to declare India as a democratic secular republic uh, is, a, is, is, is something which needs to be underlined and which needs to be stressed and because in a certain sense, the Constituent Assembly could have, could have taken an alternative position, could have mediated differently. It did not do so. And in not doing so, it actually prepared a blueprint, a blueprint for India's you know, future trajectory. Fifty years since independence, India is home to 120 million Muslims the second largest concentration in the whole world. There are almost 27 million Christians and 20 million Sikhs, besides almost 850 million Hindus.
The spirit of pluralistic existence that has been the hallmark of Indian civilization came under severe strain during the colonial rule of the British. Apprehensive of a united population mounting a challenge on colonial authority, the imperial policy of divide and rule sought to drive a wedge in the evolution of the national movement. It was on communal lines that the province of Bengal was partitioned in 1905 into East and West Bengal. The reaction against the move was swift and spontaneous. Most Indians saw through the ploy and the cries of Swadeshi rented the air. The evil design of the imperialists was foiled as the whole nation displayed a shared sense of indignation. However, by the early 1940s, the divide and rule policy of the British had managed to create a strong lobby in favor of partition of India. Social scientists maintain that the triumph of cultural pluralism for the past 50 years is a tribute to the resilience of India's civilizational heritage. After the partition, the Pakistan remained a predominantly Muslim area, almost exclusively Muslim area. India remained, however, true to secularism for the reason, among others, that the political reality, the, demogra the demographic reality, was again the same as it was before the partition. That is, the majority of the people were non-Muslim, but there's a very large population of Muslims, the largest population of Muslims next only to Indonesia. Therefore, the same circumstances, the same set of beliefs, the same historical background and cultural tradition which had made India, the Indian leadership, committed it to secularism prior to 1947, continued afterwards as well. Examples of secular traditions abound throughout the country. Fatehpur Sikri, near Agra. Built almost 500 years ago by arguably the greatest monarch of Indian history. Akbar ruled over most of what is today Pakistan, Bangladesh and even Afghanistan. When he decided to construct his dream capital near the shrine of a Sufi saint, Salim Chishti, he had decided that every turret of the fort, every arch of its doors, every palace in the interiors, virtually the entire construction would be an ode to the pluralistic society that formed his vast empire. The Mughal emperor went a step further to integrate and harmonize his multi-religious subjects by propounding a religious order called Dine Ilahi that borrowed from both Islam and Hinduism besides other world religions. The professed motive was universal brotherhood. The success of Akbar essentially lay in this particular fact that he was not a fundamentalist. He was prepared to see the good points, the moral points, the ethical points in other philosophies and religions and others. And when he exposed himself to various books of religion and interacted with what to call representatives of the various religions and others, he did find a beautiful similarity between most of the religions that he had time to examine. And that's how he came up with that idea of Deen e Ilahi. 1990s, Banaras. It is the time of Aarti at the holy temple of Kashi Vishwanath. The sounds of conch shells rent the air along with those of traditional symbols to the accompaniment of the Shehnai. The Shehnai player is housed in a building opposite the great temple. Akin to some other places of religious worship in the world, non-Hindus find restricted entry into the temple. Yet, this Shehnai player is a Muslim. The Shehnai accompanists at the Aarti have traditionally been Muslims. The temple 
built by a Hindu queen, Ahilya Bai Holkar, was originally more austere. It was Maharaja Ranjit Singh, a Sikh warrior king, who had the temple spire plated in gold. Nineteen ninety eight, the Dargah of Nizamuddin Aulia in Delhi. Hazrat Nizamuddin was a Sufi saint who lived in the thirteenth century. Sufism evolved within Islam in the medieval period. Imbued with a deep sense of humanism, the philosophy preached by the Sufi saints was of tolerance and mutual coexistence. Today, the Indian landscape is dotted with numerous Sufi shrines, places of worship where common folk, both Hindus and Muslims, congregate. There were certainly pre-existing and developing trends, both within Hindu traditions and within Islamic traditions, moving towards a greater degree of understanding between their two major religious traditions. At local levels, a wide variety of composite religious groups the ways in which Sufism and Bhakti interacted with each other. But the tenets of secularism find persuasive arguments in the stories of ordinary people, some of who have over the years gained mythic proportions. One such was a spiritual poet named Kabir. Abandoned in his infancy, Kabir was adopted by a Muslim weaver and his wife. Even today, Kabir's dohas are popular among Indians of all hues and denominations. The founder of Sikhism, Guru Nanak, was a contemporary and an admirer of the philosopher poet. The holy scripture of the Sikhs, Guru Granth Sahib, has no less than 1100 poems of Kabir. Nineteen ninety seven, the Golden Temple in Amritsar. The spiritual magnetism of the Granth Sahib draws scores of pilgrims to its holy precincts. Thousands among them are Hindus. These are not isolated islands of harmony. The mutual and dynamic coexistence of various faiths is evident as much at the Golden Temple in Amritsar as in the several festivals that mark the Indian calendar. Nineteen ninety six, Tabo, nestling in the rugged mountains of Himachal Pradesh, celebrating a thousand years of its glorious existence. Buddhists are a small minority in India today. However, the entire stretch of the Himalayas is dotted with spectacular monasteries. Their rituals are a treat for visitors from India and abroad. And every year, thousands reach for Himis in Ladakh, or Pema Yangtze in Sikkim, or even to distant Tawang in search of peace and salvation. <laughs> Six thousand years ago, Buddha was born in India and preached his message of peaceful coexistence in this land, today 
dotted with monuments to the great seer, like Sarnath near Varanasi. Buddham Saranam Gacham Dhammam The parables of Buddha and his great disciples form the core of the early education imparted to children in India as they are now part of a composite folklore. Nineteen ninety three, Goa, time for the annual carnival. The tropical paradise has an almost even population of Christians and Hindus, but here at the carnival, it is only a shared sense of celebration and the Goan spirit that engulfs the onlooker. <laughs> Nineteen ninety three, Shravana Belagola in Karnataka. It is the last anointment ceremony this century of Lord Bahubali. Jains in thousands have gathered from all corners of the country. It is as much a holy pilgrimage as the accompanying sense of celebration that attracts thousands to this hamlet. It is in these encounters that Indians demonstrate the true meaning of unity in diversity, a land which has preserved a kaleidoscope of cultural and ethnic identities. It is this diversity that has provided a great richness and variety to the culture of this land. India is not a melting pot, but it is a mosaic. It is not that you get everything and you melt it into one uniform religion or uniform thought, no. India has always permitted diversity and this is why with this globalization of the world which is taking place, where identities are now striking and wanting to have their own positions in their societies and others, India is the one which is able to offer a history of what you call this coexistence. <laughs> These diverse threads have woven together in India to give birth to a rich tapestry of art forms, both classical and popular. Many exponents of Indian classical music, whose genesis is to be found in the Hindu Vedic literature, are Muslims. Among them, the Sarod maestro, Ustad Amjad Ali Khan, who traces his musical lineage to Mia Tansen. Even the call of prayer uh, from the mosque, Allah, Allah, Akbar, Allah, Allah, Akbar. So this is Allah Akbar is fine, but there are musical notes behind that. Or Raghupati Raghav Raghav Rab. Da 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 the Sardar is playing tabla sometimes, Bengali is playing tabla sometimes, Hindu, Christian. But we never, I mean, fortunately, even the listeners, the audience, they are not bothered who they are going to listen to. That is the greatest example of secularism, respect. Arguably the greatest musician of modern India, Pandit Ravi Shankar is a disciple of the fabled Ustad Alauddin Khan of Maihar. This is the beauty of our tradition, that um, composite culture of India, that nobody ever thought uh, about the religion of the disciple or the religion of the guru. 
We just respect. If classical and semi-classical music is the preserve of the elite, then Indian cinema is the strongest common cultural denominator. The film industry itself, since its inception, is a model of a composite culture, with numerous people of different religions working together. Some of them are national icons, irrespective of their religious persuasions. In its 50 years of independence, India has constantly grappled with the complex propositions of a multi-religious polity. The inheritance of colonial rule and the partition of the country was a deep scar that has lacerated the fabric of this society. The scars have taken time to be healed. A good three decades after the independence, perhaps even more, there was a very considerable problem of Hindu-Muslim tension, Hindu-Muslim variety. This was, however, a carryover from the events that had preceded the partition of India. And it, had, it was a carryover from the horrible rioting on communal lines that happened at the time of and immediately before and immediately after the partition. Fortunately for us, over a period of time, this problem has been receding. Communal violence still manages to raise its ugly head from time to time. Yet, fundamentalism is a challenge that the Indian people are confronting head on, battling the scourge of religious fanatics. The Indian population realized that solutions to the problems of democracy is more democracy. And it is in the mantra of the vote that almost a billion people find their checks and balances. The immediate past has shown that narrow majoritism is futile in the quest for power. In the process, the people themselves are realizing that the forces of cohesion that bond Indians into a nation are far stronger and complex than simplistic rhetoric of religious populism. As democracy succeeds in this particular country, and the democracy goes down to the grassroots and others, the various identities will feel much more secure and will be voting irrespective of what you call their religious identities and others, which has already started happening. A new composite Indian identity in every region, every language area, every professional group, and every class of people is emerging in response to the massive process of socio-economic transformation that is changing the face of India. It is a nexus that will carry the country forward to the new millennium.